This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. Welcome to TWIM This Week in Microbiology, episode 151, recorded on April 27th, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. Hello again. How are you? I'm doing fine. All is well. Very good. Nice to hear from you. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How are you, Michael? I'm doing well. My feet have recovered from the march. We had a small march here in, in Charleston. It was only about six That's miles. Not as not as big as the one in, in D.C. Would that have been the March for Science? It was. That would right. have been. So yes. You, and I went to that one in... Uh, by the way, let's introduce uh, today from Florida, Michelle Swanson. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I w- did you go to a march, Michelle? I sure did in we, Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I went to the one in D.C. We uh, had a mo- most of the TWIV team there, at, at, and the day before at ASM, we did a podcast. Mm. Yeah, I tuned in for some of that. It was terrific. We had a good time in Michael uh, In San Schmidt. Diego, they had 15,000 people marching. Alas, I couldn't do it because my knees don't let me walk a mile, so I couldn't mm-hmm. do it. That's but a lot that was of people. In spirit. That's yeah, great. They, they were estimating more than ten thousand in Ann Arbor too. That's nice. Wow! I That's tell exciting. you, I, I've said to uh, many people, I've never been in the presence of so many scientists before. I mean, <laughs> the, at Washington, the area around the Washington Monument was packed, and you know, even at the biggest meeting I've gone to, there's never that many scientists. I felt it was exciting and also humbling to know so many people are working in science or love science. It was just great. Yeah, it was inspiring. I, I just hope we can continue this momentum and keep everyone aware, you know, not just have it end after one day. And you know what? I think it's on us. We need to do a better job of communicating to the public um, the value of science and what our lives are like in the process, which Absolutely. of course is what we do here on TWIM. We do it here and we hope to inspire other people to do different things. Everyone needs to do a little bit and then yeah. we come out as being one unified wall of scientists. And I think that's really important. Mm. Speaking of communicating, the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education is now accepting submissions for a science communication themed issue. How about that? This is going to explore evaluation and impact of various forms of science communication, understanding cognitive biases related to scientific topics, encouraging engagement in science-based dialogues, and much more. The deadline for submission is August 7th. You can meet the guest editor team and learn more at asmscience.org slash jmbe, a very simple URL. And, you know, just like everything else, so we have science communication, and then we have the science of science communication, (laughs) (laughs) right? Everything gets uh, self-examining in some way, but that's fine. That's the way things work here. All right. We have an interesting follow-up from Donna, and she writes, Hello, I've been listening to your podcast for more than a year now and was delighted when I tuned in to your 150th episode. Currently, I'm working as a post back in a research laboratory in Hamilton, Montana. Coincidentally, the location of episode 140, Small Town Big Science, currently applying to clinical laboratory science programs. While I am very excited about what this career path has to offer, I have definitely seen the lack of recognition and respect that people receive in this profession. This is very unfortunate as laboratory professionals are essential to the hospital community. Thank you for shedding some light on this important profession. So happy to do that. We had a great uh, episode 150 with Robin Patel. And we hope that uh, those of you out there who don't know much about this profession learned a little bit about it. It's true that they do their job so well, but they're in the background that we don't yeah. appreciate it. So that's, again, part of our mission. It needs to be to educate people of all the ways scientists are contributing to society. 
By the way, one of our faithful listeners, uh, Brian Barry, pointed out to me that the starting salaries of the technologists mm. are not exactly overwhelming. So that's a problem that ought to be corrected somehow. Mm. These yeah. are people who work very hard and are highly trained. They go through a lot of schooling. I'm talking about the subdoctoral level. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they don't make the money they should. Mm. Yep, always a problem. In uh, in a lot of these jobs, you know, teaching is a similar one, not not terribly well compensated, and that can factor in people's decisions on what kind of careers they want to make. Of course, just too bad. All right, we have for your enjoyment today a snippet and a paper, which are kind of related in a in a way that you will see. And the first one is uh, going to be discussed for us by Michael. What do you have for us, Michael? Well, um. Since it's it's springtime and things are coming out of hibernation, I thought I'd introduce you to this neat paper that was in applied in environmental microbiology entitled Western Bats as a Reservoir of Novel Streptomyces Species with Antifungal Activity. This is a collaborative effort by a number of authors. Paris Ham is the first author, followed by Nicole Cami, Diana Northrup. Ernst Valdez, Debbie Bucher, uh, Chris Dunlap, David Labida, Shiloh Leshow, and Andrea uh, Soros Alfaro. Thank you. <laughs> and they're from the Department of Biological Sciences at Western Illinois University in Macomb, Illinois, the Department of Biology at the University of New Mexico, the U.S. Geologic Survey at Fort Collins Science Center in Fort Collins, and uh, from the uh, group of, there's a lot of other places. So this paper is really all about, it takes a village um, to study this particular problem. So I'm going to start with a, a brief summary. And frequent listeners to TWIM know the, the problem that we're having. We all appreciate that we're concerned about the degree to which resistant to antibiotics continues to emerge at an ever alarming rate. This is quite evident when you pick up your morning paper and read about a poor individual dying from a totally drug-resistant infection. But we need to consider our friends, the bats, here, here well, in- Hold on a second. Let me, let me interrupt you for a second, sure. Michael. Um, when you, you hear about antibiotic resistance, it's invariably about bacteria. Tell us, is the problem as big with antifungal drugs as it is with uh, bacteria developing resistance? The antifungal property, the antifungal problem is getting bigger with each passing day. There are not too many antifungal drugs out there. And just like bacteria, the fungi are really clever little creatures and they're adapting to many of the frontline drugs that are currently in the marketplace. Uh, you're probably familiar with many of the drugs because they all seem to end in the word Zol. And <laughs> And uh, it's principally going after their targets, uh, which happen to be some of the human targets. And so there's not as many good targets in the eukaryotic fungi as there are in the prokaryotic bacteria. So this paper. Michael, let me just interrupt. I just got a tweet from Arturo Casadeval. Fun uh -oh. Fungal diseases are rising. Global warming may be a contributing factor. <coughs> and so... You know, uh, not only don't we not have a lot of antifungals, but we're having more and more fungal infections. And they're developing increasing resistance is the point. Yeah. And, and they are. And and in fact, if you look at this population that we're going to talk about here today, namely the bats and specifically white nose syndrome and white nose syndrome is is absolutely a devastating invasive bat disease. It started on the east coast of the United States, and it's slowly creeping west. And it's already made its jump across the Mississippi in less than 10 years. And I have, uh, there's a map. They actually publish a weekly map as if this were a pandemic of influenza for humans. The, the folks concerned about white nose syndrome in bats are very much concerned about how quickly this devastating and invasive bat disease caused by a fungus aptly named pseudo 
Gymnanicus destructans. It, it sounds like a, a Roman gladiator. <laughs> and this particular fungus with the name destructans has killed more than 6 million bats in the last seven years. And so it's, it's an absolutely frightening story for bats. But the story here today is, is we go out to Arizona and New Mexico where white nose syndrome has not yet invaded. And there's a great area of caves out there. The one that most of our listeners will probably be familiar with is, is Carlsbad Cave. But in addition, these authors went off and they did an exploration and they harvested the microbial flora associated with the bats that are living in five distinct cave regions in Arizona and New Mexico. And in the supplemental section of the paper, there's a map showing you how wide an area they actually explored looking for, and the topic of today's paper is namely the actinobacteria, more specifically from the genus Streptomyces. And, and this is all part of the prelude, at least two thirds of the antibiotics that are currently in use across um, the medical marketplace, and this is both for humans and livestock and animals, specifically come from actinobacteria, namely, uh, more specifically, the genus Streptomyces. So our story- but that's true for antibacterial. How many antifungals come from Streptomyces? Not that many. I don't know the precise number. So that's, again, why this is a, a headline story, so to speak, that they mm-hmm. were, a, the, I'll give you the bottom line up front. They went out to these caves, they harvested the uh, microbiome associated with the uh, membrane and skin of and fur of the bats, and they were able to isolate actinobacteria that were actually able to produce a very potent antifungal compound that could retard the growth up to 30 days of this fungus, uh, Pseudogymnanicus destructans, for up to, for greater than 30 days. And so it's, it's a really neat story. Some background on the actinobacteria. These are a diverse and abundant invertebrates. And this, these organisms can constitute the largest portion of our skin microbiome for, for humans. And they are also dominant on the skin of different amphibians. So this is where we go to Vincent's paper later in our story. They're also found on fish and our story here today, bats. The actinobacteria are adapted for life in the nutritional desert of our skin. And if you think about where these folks were looking for antimicrobial products, they were looking in the desert of the cave because there's not very many nutrients in caves because they're effectively dead ends, if you will. And the the only source of nutrient that the cave has to, to feed the microbe is, of course, the guano from the bats and whatever else is being inputted into that particular cave. And we don't know too much about cave microbiology. And in fact, a um, hundred episodes ago in <laughs> TWIM 51, we had <laughs> Hazel Barton. Wow. So it was a hundred episodes ago at TWIM 51 that Hazel came and talked to us about cave microbiology. And so when I stumbled into this paper, uh, I thought that uh, this would be a great one to talk about in a snippet. So in a cave, The actinobacteria represent the most abundant microbes on the cave walls and those associated with these guano or nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium-rich deposits that are effectively the stool, if you will, of the bats. And as you can guess, this is what our adventuresome scientists did in this particular study. They went out and looked for the diversity of these naturally occurring actinobacteria associated with healthy bats. These are healthy bats, I need to stress. They, they have not seen this horrible fungus and they're living in New Mexico and Arizona. And their principal question 
that they wanted to ask is if the microbiome of these bats harbored microbes with an active antifungal activity against the pathogen that is causing such devastation that killed already 6 million bats. Also for the show notes, I I give you why it's called white nose syndrome uh, off of one of the websites that's pleading the plight of the poor bat. It actually shows the fungus. It looks like that piece of bread that you have in your refrigerator that all of a sudden has sprouted bread mold and it's growing Mm -hmm. on the nose of the poor little bat. And by the way, it's interesting that white is a common color in mycotic infections because slush infection by candida is so called because it makes the mouth of the affected child look white. So white is a recurring color here. Yes. And and Michael, I agree that picture is pathetic, the poor bat, but you know what? Poor us if we wipe out the bat species because they pay, play such an important part of many ecological cycles. Um, so they eat a lot of pests, they pollinate, and they also deliver seeds and disperse seeds around land. And so our agriculture is very much benefited from bats. Mm. So we need them. And in fact, here here in the Southeast, we're very much concerned about this because of uh, Zika virus, because the bats are the principal species controlling the bulk ah, of the mosquito mosquitoes, wow. right? Mm. And you know, it's it's absolutely frightening. The other issue is we don't have too many hibernating bats because it typically doesn't get cold enough here in the southeast to to worry about those issues. But at the same time, if the fungus is going to actually attack these poor bats, it it really is pretty dev- devastating. So they go out and their study resulted in the development uh, or the understanding of antifungal production. They went out and they sampled the bats um, on their surfaces and they principally did it they, they had three areas that they, they sampled. The first area that they sampled is they sampled all over the bat on its fur and skin, and they used a selective medium called humic acid vitamin auger. And this is a new medium, relatively speaking. It's a, it was developed by a Japanese group in the late 80s. And it's, uh, humic acid is, of course, both a carbon and nitrogen source for the microbe, and there's very little else in it. And when they went and swabbed the animal, and this is just a normal Q-tip-like thing, and they were just using either double distilled water or uh, ringer's lactate to effectively sample the organism, they were able to isolate 274 microbes. And then on the right side of the animal, they used actinomycete isolation auger, which is again a medium that is comprised of an amino acid L asparagine as its carbon and nitrogen source, and they throw in a little sodium caseinate and sodium propanate for a little bit of extra carbon. They were able to pull out 252 distinct isolates. Then on the left side, they used another selective and differential auger called gallon gum. And uh, gallon gum is this agar alternative. It's a water-soluble polysaccharide. Oh, gelin. Yeah. It goes by the name of gelin. <laughs> gelin, <laughs> which is also gel right, which some of us may have seen. It's the ultra-clear Petri plates, if you've ever seen them at a meeting. And they use the left side of the organ of the bat to screen that. And they were only able to get 94 isolates. And also from the left side, they use good old glucose yeast extract agar, and they only got 12 because the actinobacteria don't like a very rich medium. They like a very unnutritional sort of medium. And when they characterized those isolates, they learned that Streptomyces was the dominant genus with about 422 out of the 632 isolates they were able to harvest. And they give you a nice breakdown of which cave gave them which organism. So I'll leave that for you to investigate. Uh, The only quibble I have with the editing of this paper is in table one, I would have liked to seen the map of where the caves were in concert with this because it would have helped me 
understand if there was any geographic uh, distribution. But the thing I want to spend some time on is how they did their antifungal assay. And this is a really clever way of doing it. They use something called a bilayer plate assay adapted after the variation of Montano and Henderson, which is a modified version of an auger diffusion assay. I did it as a graduate student in the dark age, and it's pretty clever. You have your target microbe, which in this case is the evil fungus destructans, and you're asking the question, have you isolated an organism that can kill it? And so the way this assay is done is the first thing you do is you fill the bottom of a plate with a medium that can grow your antibiotic producing isolate. And the medium that they used was R2A, which is a common environmental medium that anyone who's done environmental microbiology is well familiar with. They allow it to solidify, then they streak the plate down the center line with the sporulating bacterial inoculum. And they use enough to have at least 10,000, or excuse me, they use enough so that they'll get confluent growth. They allow the microbes to incubate for up to about 14 days. Once those organisms have developed, then they take a layer of Saborose dextrose agar, which is the tryptocase soy agar or luria agar for fungi. They allow it to cool and they pour it carefully over the growing antimicrobial producing micro and they allow it to solidify and then they put a hundred microliters at a 90 degree angle to the isolate that's growing and so there's between a hundred thousand to a million canidia of the destructins in this 100 microliter so that they have a sufficient density and they then just simply ask the question do they get a zone of inhibition around the where they intersect and they have a defined zone of inhibition? And of the 632 isolates these folks screened, 36% or about 5.7% displayed antifungal properties. And I thought that was pretty remarkable. Out of the screen of 632. So imagine 632 Petri plates sitting on your bench. <laughs> Only 36 of them gave you this antifungal property. But they must have been jumping up and down when they got this because here's a microbe that is present on the fur and the skin and the membranes of the bat that has the potential maybe to protect it should this fungus that's on the East Coast make it out to Arizona and New Mexico. And it's just a, a remarkable story. But Michael, you think the, the bats in the Northeast don't have these streptomyces and that's, that's why well, they're infected? That's one of the limitations of the paper, Vincent. Mm -hmm. they, they, of course, don't have the control from those studies, or at least they didn't identify it in their discussion. Mm. So summing up, the stable beneficial interactions between streptomyces in many organisms are common, but they have not yet been reported in vertebrates. So what the study ultimately goes on to show us is that caves and bats are a rich reservoir for novel antimicrobial producing species. And there's a great potential for the discovery of novel antifungal compounds, but like everything, additional work is necessary. As Ilya pointed out to me uh, before we went on the air, what's missing from this? And there's no spectra. I would have thought for sure they would have tried to suck some of the liquor off of, from the microbes growing under that agar layer to try to see what they were secreting because the streptomyces are great secretors of, of antibiotics. And so I would have thought in the days of, you know, where you can use precious little to do a GCMS to figure out what they were. And the question is, why didn't the editor ask them? Or maybe that's the next paper and we just have to stay tuned. And the authors ultimately conclude by 
you know, raising the ideal state that we all hope for is the use of probiotics. And so whether or not we could develop a probiotic mist that we could spray into caves for hibernating animals, I, I think is the great promise and may be able to treat some of these caves. So as Michelle said, we can address this horrible problem of, of white nose syndrome in bats. Ilya, you were going to say something. No, I was just going to echo what you just said. Uh, I'm surprised that this article, this paper was accepted without some chemistry. It's really not asking a lot these days. So I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised. I mean, if I were the editor, I would say, go back and show me a little bit of the chemistry that you can do easily. So I don't know. And let's hope that they do it. But by the way, um, besides that, it is, uh, I looked it up and it is the case that streptomyces are the source of some of the major antifungals. So in that sense, they're right. Amphotericin B, candidacin, and a few others are made by streptomyces. So this, they're on the right, on the right path. But, uh, you know, show me, show me what they make. You're just being greedy. <laughs> I'm being greedy, of course. I mean, it's not no, it's no skin of my. That's bad. right. It's not your time in the lab. It's not. <laughs> but I, I'm hopeful. I am hopeful. I, I think they were so excited sure. about seeing this right. result, and it's such a devastating disease. I mean, just yeah, well, imagine if what you just had. said to to claim that this is a probiotic, that this is a way. Uh, a possible reason why these bats are not infected. That's a real stretch. Oh, no, I, mean, I agree. I agree. But I think they're just, you know, you know, they, they have to be a little provocative at the end in their discussion. Sure. Of course. It's their entitled. Well, I do think it's an interesting question that if the Northeastern bats have these streptomyces, why are they being infected? And if they don't have them, why? And so forth. So that's interesting. Also, Michael, they didn't try, they only tried destructins didn't try any other yes. fungi or bacteria. You, you would uh, expect that they would get antimicrobial activity against other organisms, right? I, I would indeed, because of the mm -hmm. isolates, they only did it against destructants. Yeah. My suspicion is, is they're doing a massive screen to see what this collection of 632 isolates actually reveals. Yep. Sure. Hmm. Because of the because of the commercial potential of this project, do you think that influenced their decision about how much to publish initially? Well, I would normally say yes, but it, the one of the authors is with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, based out of Peoria, mm -hmm. and so you you wonder it's it you would almost think that the unless the government is into the business of patenting everything now too. Hmm. So, if, Michael, if you want to spray um, an antimicrobial in a cave, I guess you don't need FDA approval for that, right? Well, as long as it's bacteria. I, I think you can mist the yeah. bacterium. I mean, if it's it's no different than um, allowing these guano dumps to dry and yeah. the bacteria naturally move about. Yep. All right. Nice stuff. You, you know, just look and you'll find, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a great reminder that a lot of our great antimicrobials came from the microbial world. Yep. Yeah. They're really good at making things to inhibit each other. Yeah. And, you know, on the same theme, um, our paper, our second paper today is the same idea, except instead of bats, we're going to look at Lepidoptera for antimicrobials and Lepidoptera, of course, are butterflies and moths. And this is a paper published in Cell Chemical Biology. It's called Symbiont-Derived Antimicrobials Contribute to the Control of the Lepidopteran Gut Microbiota. And the authors are Xiao Chen Sun, Ishida, Hertweck, and Boland. And these authors are from uh, Zhejiang University in China, the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Jena, Germany, and the Hans Knoll Institute also in Jena, in the Friedrich Schiller University, uh, which I saw once many, many years ago. So this is all about a lepidopteran called Spodoptera littoralis, also known as the African cotton leafworm or the Egyptian cotton leafworm. And it is a moth found throughout Africa and Europe. Uh, it's also been found in the U.K., 
where it was accidentally imported. And it's a pest on vegetables, fruits, flowers, and other crops. Big time. Big, Big time. time pest. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is a, um, a a moth that has a simple alimentary canal. It's a tube, but it has a large bacterial population, like 10 to the 7th colony forming units per milliliter. And even though it's big, it's a pretty simple microbial community. So we're talking about the gut microbiome of, of this species, Podoptera littoralis. Pretty simple uh, community dominated by Enterococci and Clostridium species. And there is one called Enterococcus munti, is the most metabolically active member of this community. And it's a very interesting uh, situation here. What happens is early in development uh, of this organism, other Enterococci are present, and these come from diet. Now, these are uh, these these moths and and uh, the their their precursors. They're eating plants, of course, and plants are full of potentially harmful microbes. So these, uh, the as these develop, they're eating lots of uh, uh, plant materials that have bacteria on them. So early in development, the first instar, in fact, the uh, dominant organisms are Enterococci fecalis and Caselli flavus. And these are potential pathogens. But then in the second instar, as development proceeds, an instar, of course, is the developmental stage, these potential pathogens quickly go away as E. munti goes up. And so they want to know how this happens in this paper. So there's a transition in the gut microbiome. They want to know what, what's going on. So what they, can, what they initially do is they simply culture uh, a variety of enterococci from uh, littoralis. This includes E. munti, E. Cassi, Castle flavus and E. fecalis. Um, and as I said, the latter two are potential pathogens and they're highly present in the first instar, but then go away. If you take larvae that don't have E. munti in them and you infect them with E. fecalis and E. caselli flavus, they get sick, they cause disease. They have pictures of, of larvae that are all deformed because of infection. So that shows that those two are pathogenic. Now, yeah, even I could score that pathology. Pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> quite good. Yeah, I think like all withering. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite clear. I was like, oh, wow, what's going on with these? Too yeah. bad. Uh, and then they do uh, a similar assay to what Michael described. They do inhibition assays and in agar plates. And what they do here is they, they plate out lawns of bacteria on the plate, and then they spot uh, individual bacteria to see if those produce something that will inhibit the lawn, basically. And what they find is that E. munti inhibits E. fecalis and E. caselli flavus. All right. So you can clearly see zones of inhibition. There's a nice circle where the growing E. munti are inhibiting the other bacteria. And then, of course, they also try growing up these bac uh, the E. munti in culture. They take the culture fluid and they remove the bacteria. And that also has activity that can inhibit caselli flavus and fecalis. Now, interestingly, Whatever is in this culture fluid does not inhibit E. munti. All right. It's specific for Caselli flavus and fecalis. So it's immune, so to speak. Yeah. So that's an interesting question, which I wondered if anyone had. Why would they be immune to what they produce? Um, why? They have the how? antidote. How? <laughs> not, not why. That's, uh, we don't need to have the why. Oh, they're, making, they're making an antidote. They're making many of these mm. Many of these toxin toxin producing strains, if you will, it, even though it's it's a peptide, these they yeah. have the antidote to inactivate it. So it's something that binds it and prevents it from Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that makes sense, of course, otherwise they they would die themselves and that would not be a strategy for evolutionary persistence, right? Right. Yes. Survival. All right. So this uh antimicrobial activity from E. munti, which again is in the gut of these moths after the uh in the second instar and beyond. Uh, this is produced as the bacteria grows and it's stable from pH five to 10 and it's stable at a hundred degrees Celsius for an hour. That's pretty stable. <laughs> and they That's say pretty good and spooky as it were, you know, to be in the gut, uh, you have to survive extremes. And so this, uh, whatever this is, is pretty good. Also works against gram positive pathogens. They tested Listeria monocytogenes and Listeria innocua, which can infect lep various lepidopterans and cause disease. And then they go on to isolate it. So, Elio, they do some chemistry in this paper. 
which Yay. you'll be happy. They isolate the- one in figure four. I mean, that's what the previous paper was missing is figure four from yeah. this work. So they do a, a nice purification using a biological assay and they end up using mass spectrometry to identify it as a 43 amino acid peptide. And so this is... It's quite a peptide, isn't it? 43 amino acids is almost a protein. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> when do you draw it's the medics. line? <laughs> it's a peptide trying to be a protein. A peptide trying to be a protein. That could be a title, Alio. I like that. Uh, and this is a bacteriosin. These are peptides made by bacteria that inhibit other bacteria. They call this one Muntisin KS. And these have been around for, the bacteriosins have been long around for a long time. They were, they were once called colicins, right? Because they inhibited E. coli. Right. And uh, they were also found in the skin of frogs. Um, They're all over the place. There are thousands yeah. of them. All over An the ancient place. ancient antimicrobial. Yeah. The question we should discuss sometimes is, you know, if there are so many, what's the real role and why are they not used therapeutically? And by the way, I can answer my own question. One of the answers is the hard to make in industrial quantities. Oh, yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. They're expensive. 43 amino acids synthetically is not an easy task. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, you could make them by fermentation, I suppose, but it's, they're, they're very hard to handle. Yeah. Yeah, very expensive. It's, um, a class, it's a class of compounds that is really fascinating and it requires a lot of attention. Let's do it sometimes. Okay. We could uh, find someone who is an expert in these right. have to come on. Anyway, they identify the gene that encodes this, uh, a precursor to this peptide. It turns out it's on a plasmid. Also, there is a transport protein right nearby, which is involved in getting this out of the, the bacteria. And they, by looking at the structure, they think it probably kills bacteria by poking holes in the membrane. It has alpha helical regions, which they think could pe- penetrate the uh, membrane of target uh, bacteria. And they look at the mRNA of this uh, bacteria sin. They see it's in, in the first instar in the larvae. It's expressed at very low levels. And then it's highly expressed from the second instar on as E. munti rises. Uh, its numbers rise and then the, the bacteria sin rises as well. And the last set of experiments are actually very important. If you take away um, E. munti, you can infect larvae with, with E. fecalis. Okay. Um, if you have. E. munti present in the larvae, you can't infect them with E. fecalis, but you can make a derivative of E. munti that lacks the gene for muntisin, the muntisin biosynthesis gene. And if you populate the larvae with those E. munti, you can now infect them with E. fecalis. So all those, it's a nice way of showing that. Uh, and finally, feeding the bacteria sin uh, to larvae that are already infected with E. fecalis causes a 60% reduction in the presence of that bacteria. So well, so it's necessary and sufficient. That's right. It's necessary and sufficient. So Muntisin KS gets rid of pathogenic invading bacteria as these larvae develop, and they assure that they're not present and that E. munti is there and um, takes care of things. And by the way, E. munti grows as a biofilm in the gut of these lepidopterans. So it makes a protective biofilm that is producing these bacteria sins that get rid of anything nasty that comes in, or at least these two organisms, probably others as well. So it's a defensive symbiont. Imunta gets a place to live, and in exchange, it uh, provides a defense to uh, the uh, the lepidopteran. And this is this is a, they say this is the first uh, bacteria sin that's been found in a lepidopteran. But are there, are there other examples of gut bacteria that that protect? Uh, other lepidopterans and insects, they talk, they give some examples. One of them is a lactobacillus that uh, is found in the intestine of honeybees that inhibits the growth of a pathogen called penibacillus larvae. And so probably this is very, very frequent. So and it's it, very clever on the part of the host, huh? Yeah, of course. To make yeah. a microbe be your defense system. Yeah, they call it an immune organ. Yeah, the microbiome as an immune organ. I like that. I think that's cool. I think that's what we're looking at it as part of the new concept of it being a our newest organ system, or do we assign it to, you know, the immune system that we presently have? Yeah. No. So the in in a number of organisms, and I'm thinking of mice. We know that the microbiome helps the immune system to develop, but on its own, here at least. 
it, it is, is the immune, immune system. Yeah, it is an immune right. system on its own. And usually when I've thought of colonization resistance and when I've taught it, I've explained that the uh, microbes that make the host resistant are maybe bind, occupying all the binding sites mm-hmm. or they're mm-hmm. consuming all the nutrients. But this is quite a more aggressive tactic. It they're is. actually killing off in, mm-hmm. invaders. Very yeah. cool. Now, would you um, um, imagine that you could get resistance to these bacteria sins? I guess since munt, e munti is resistant, that would be one mechanism to make an antidote, right? Mm. Mm. Well, and the taking up such a large peptide requires some work, and some bacteria may just simply not take it up. Also, the phase of growth. Mm. Also, the phase of growth. Remember, this is like competence. The the classic and the the strep pneumo is they have to be competent to take up DNA and it's this whole mm-hmm. peptide mm-hmm. conundrum that they work on. And I know some bacteria modify their LPS, which is their major coding. Mm-hmm. And in that way they can f- not interact with certain peptides as much. So that oh, I think cool. is another bacterial strategy to make themselves resistant. Yeah, that makes sense. Michelle, do you think that's why the canonical quorum sensing molecule and the gram negatives is homoserine lactone, and then the gram positives, it's these peptides that are the signaling because the gram positives fail to have the LPS that would prevent a peptide, or that would allow the peptide in, whereas the gram negatives don't have that opportunity to bring the peptide in because they have the LPS layer. Hmm, could be. I've often, I've often wondered why gram positives don't use the homoserine lactones like the gram negatives, but that may be the real reason is that mm. peptides can't get across the LPS. That's interesting. So let me summarize. Now, we over on TWIV, we had a request that at the end of our discussion, we, we give a layperson summary so that someone who's listening that, that's lost could at least get the bottom line. <laughs> and I think that's a great idea. So here, what these authors have shown is that in a moth, they carry a symbiont, a bacterium in their gut, that clears pathogenic bacteria from them. They eat a lot of plants, so they're always ingesting pathogenic bacteria. And there's a p- particular bacteria called E. munti, which makes a, a short protein, 43 amino acids, that kills uh, any pathogenic bacteria that try and get into this, uh, this moth gut, or the larvae gut. So that's, that's it. And whether, as we've said, whether you could use these antimicrobial peptides to treat human diseases. People have tried this for many years, but there are problems with it. So I'm not sure there's much of a practical application of this, but we learn a lot about how the microbiome contributes to the development of uh, metazoans from this. Is that a fair summary? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. I wonder if as the synthetic biology field um, progresses, we'll do a come up with more innovative ways of getting microbes to pump out these antimicrobials. Maybe. Maybe. Sure. Never say never. Right, Michelle. Right. Right. Not in microbiology. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, what I liked about this paper, and one of the, one of the, I like a lot of things about it, but one of the things I liked is that they can actually grow the organism. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> this caused me to get a very strange, somewhat strange reaction from a graduate student. Uh, in a course that I'm involved in, a graduate course, we uh, discussed this paper, and the students had to write a little bit of something about it, and the come prepared to discuss it. And one guy writes that the thing, I ask him, what do you like and dislike about the paper? So his student writes, I, I like actually discovered a small molecule that has antimicrobial activity. I think it's very good. <laughs> what did it dislike? Could have benefited from shotgun metagenomics <laughs> and not relied upon culturing bacteria. <laughs> and that's a bit turnaround. I would have thought that culturing bacteria is the gold standard. <laughs> Plus, but many of their functional days, assays depended on yeah, sure. culturing that's the right. bacteria. That's right. yeah. Well, so you know, anyhow. both papers in both papers today, we use culturing organisms to do the work. Yeah. And, and, you know, mostly we talk about metagenomics here. And when we always lament, ah, oh, they're not culturable and so forth. Here we have one where they're, they're both culturable. So I think that's great. You know, <laughs> and it brings up the sort of a general point that it, when, when people start looking at ways of culturing the unculturable, they usually find them. 
the, the fact that something grows in nature means that somehow you've got to be able to replicate that in a laboratory. And if you are patient, often it takes three months to get a colony or longer. It takes strange media, like media that have almost no nutrients in them, etc. So all these things are noble efforts. And if you target a certain organism for cultivability, there's a good chance that if you're patient and have enough money and time that you're going to find it. It's, it's kind of funny because uh, it's, it's sort of the, the, what is it, the great plate count paradox is more in the minds of people than in reality. Of course, it's also true that we, some people estimated the number of bacteria species, whatever species means, is something in the trillions. Okay. Now, if that's the case... Let's not try to cultivate everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, not going idea. back to the the walk for science, as I saw many posters out there saying, you know, you know, there is no Plan B. Earth is it. And if you think about Mars being devoid, planet B. wait a minute, this, planet. The pun That's was, right. There's no Planet B. Yeah, there's no Planet B. I, I stand corrected. Yeah. And think about. The, the conundrum that they're going to face on Mars, can you bring a trillion species that has a dynamic ecosystem, even if it's under a dome? How are you going to get a trillion organisms to Mars? You know, uh, they tried to do a, a, the biosphere thing uh, in Arizona years ago, remember? And right. They couldn't get that to work properly. No. <laughs> I mean, you, you, when you put in everything that's autoclaved and then you try to make it work, they forgot the anaerobes. That was the problem with the Arizona oh, experiment, yeah? if mm -hmm. I'm remembering right. They forgot the anaerobes and how, you know, you need this tight uh, equilibrium symbiosis going on. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for culturing. So there's a lot to be, I was glad a, both of these cultured. There's a lot to be said for nature being really yes, good. nature too. <laughs> yeah. On its own, right? In fact, yeah. Well, a lot of eons of trial and error. Yeah, that's right. A lot of trial and error. That's it. Making mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Now we have some uh, a couple of emails I'd like to read before we wrap up here. One is from Tarwin who writes, Hi, Twimsters. First, as always, thanks for all your work. Sorry if I'm pedantic in the following, but I know you all like to be quite specific a lot of the time. When listening to the episode Viral Arbitrium, when talking about prions, I got a little confused with the discussion. This is probably simply that I lack understanding, but I still found it confusion. confusing. Uh, Tarwin, probably not. If I remember, uh, maybe we didn't explain it so well. There are times when we don't explain things all that well, especially me. But uh, I'm, I appreciate your asking for some help. All right, Tarwin continues. The beginning of the confusion was when talking about the central dogma, and it was saying that this breaks it. This was corrected, but that was the start of confusing things. All right, so prions, of course, are infectious proteins that cause disease and you know the central dogma is, is a dna rna protein and this is uh it, it doesn't really break it because we're not going backwards but it is an organism without a nucleic acid it simply propagates by causing other proteins like itself to misfold would you call it an organism you said an organism yeah there i go i'm making mistakes again i'm just misspeaking <laughs> a protein <laughs> Yeah, actually, yesterday in, in my virology course, we had the lecture on prions, and uh, and and someone at the end said, it's not a living organism. I said, it's not even an organism. Maybe that's why I, I misspoke. <laughs> an entity. An entity. It's a protein, of course. A prion is a protein, and when it misfolds, it becomes pathogenic. Uh, Tarwin said, it was said that prions secrete amyloid, mm. and maybe that was me. Again, I misspoke. Was it meant that they can create an amyloid? Yes, they misfold. They aggregate in the brain. And that leads to these aggregates, these fibrillar aggregates called amyloids. You know, of course, they don't secrete amyloids. I'm sorry about that. Uh, there was talk about Congo Red being a way to detect amyloids, uh, but also a way to detect prions. Did you mean that because prions may form amyloids? Well, it turns out that Congo Red is simply a dye that stains them. And in the paper, they used it as a way of visualizing the prions. So it will stain prions and it will stain the aggregates. I think that probably you are right that it's staining the, the aggregates, the amyloids. It was agreed that it is likely that archaea also have prions and joked prokaryotes came before everything. This was confusing as the whole discussion was about finding prions in pro prokaryotes, I thought. 
Also, is there evidence that archaea came before bacteria, or is is it that there is evidence that archaea may not have changed as much as bacteria from when their lineages broke away from each other because the environments that archaea live in are likely more like those at the time? Anybody, who who came first, the chicken or the egg? Mm. Were archaea around first, or was there simply a common ancestor that diversified into archaea, prokaryotes, and eukaryotes uh, all around the same time? I don't think anyone knows the definitive answer. Yeah, I think so. Do you know, Elio? No, I, I know there are a lot of opinions. You can draw the yeah, origin yeah. of life any way you want. And I wasn't there to see it, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry we joked, but we have had a series of papers where fundamental things like the nucleus, prions, were, have all been found in prokaryotes and bacteria. And so we joke that they invented everything. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, uh, we don't mean to uh, confuse you by joking. Sometimes we have to. We sort of mean it's true. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely, Michelle. Yeah, he's he wants to know what's the story with archaea. So right, yeah, and that's hard to know. Right. All right. The following comment is of interest because I listened to it three times to make sure I tried to understand things. I had more thoughts than usual about the content. In terms of what prions do in bacteria, does it make sense that they could? be a way to have, say, a strong promoter without much energy. Maybe you want a switch that is quite quick, but at times when you want to flick that switch, you don't have a lot of energy to produce new proteins. So having prion proteins that can switch without having them remade helps. Perfect. I think that's perfect. That's right on, right? And it could be sensitive to the local environmental conditions, and that could be the trigger. And his last point, uh, there was also questions on why there are only small examples of pathogenic prions. I don't. I only know of the prion in humans that that is pathogenic. I know we're not meant to ask these questions, but in humans, sheep, etc., they're proteins that are created anyway. It's just that they don't normally fold this way. After a long life, procreation has already happened. It is more likely that a protein will misfold and become a prion, but there isn't a fitness cost here. So why bother fixing the protein that's already doing its job? correctly folded version. Now that's an interesting thought. Yeah, so the answer pre- is if it happens early, then you don't get to reproduction. That's right. Right. And so he's saying these, these, at least in humans, you know, the prion diseases typically happen uh, in older people. And so he's saying, maybe we don't bother to fix these misfolded proteins. Mm. That's possible. And also they're very tough proteins, these misfolded prions, and maybe not possible. You can't even digest them with proteinase K, you know, so it may not be right. possible to, to fix them. It's kind of a sad thought to think that um, evolution <laughs> doesn't care about fitness of somebody that's past their reproductive age. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but, Get used to it. Get used to it. <laughs> but, you know, we're not meant to live. We're not meant to live this long, right? So well, we, are prolonging, yourself. we are prolonging our own lives by, medi- <laughs> by medical advances, right? You know, at the beginning of the 20th century, the average lifespan was about 50. And before that, it was even less. So we're prolonging our our life more than evolution provided for. So that, you know, prion disease may be one of the uh, results. Cancer is another one, you know, happens right. later on. So anyway, Tarwin, thank you. They're great questions and great thoughts. Lovely. We appreciate it. Um, there's one here from Mark. Mark is our friend in uh, California. Dear purveyors of twim osmoiasis. Ooh. First, here in California's South Bay, we are having a few days of sunshine between storms. From what I observe, the New York metro area is oscillating between regimes of unusually warm or cold and high precipitation. I'm writing for two reasons. One, to continue a listener email and host discussion thread from a few summers ago. In that discussion, Dr. Michael Copperman Schmidt. Oh, God, what did I get in trouble for now? <laughs> Another listener, emailer, and I were making various points about grapes, flies, yeast, and fermenting wine. I'm sending the attached image, which I took in the tasting room of a local winery. To me, it distills some worldly wisdom you might share with listeners as the episode's image on Microbe TV. And this picture he sent says In wine, there is wisdom. In beer, there is freedom. In water, there is bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> only so true amen number two to share some levity as a listener pick of the week many are familiar with the dry satiric humorous wit of the onion well there is a site that parodies the onion focusing on science the site is the allium the allium.com 
Here's an article demonstrating their humor. Uh, be careful. The link language will earn you an explicit tag. Yeah, this is a, an article called First Draft Peer. Let me let me get the actual article title. Here we go. First Draft of Peer Review Rebuttal Just Says F Off. And it's a, a funny article, which, yes, is a little bit. Um, it, it, this is a family show, so we can't really mention. <laughs> Keep up yes, the good sir. work. The only improvement that I can think of is to go to a weekly recording schedule. All the best, uh, Mark. Thanks, Mark. All right. And this, let me just do, I just have two short ones here. So uh, let me read one from Diana who writes, Dear doctors, I'm a vet student in my final year at the University of Veterinary Medicine in Vienna, Austria. Unfortunately, I have discovered your podcast rather late. Studying along while listening and learning from your podcast would have been a lot more fun. Of course, I would be delighted to hear more vet stuff from you, but since I am interested in wildlife and emerging diseases, I am also excited to hear about your regular topics, vector-borne diseases and zoonoses from a human medical perspective. I highly enjoyed the podcast at the Bronx Zoo. Please invite again Dr. Callie. That was over on TWIP. My question is, if you have ever discussed the tuberculosis vaccine, BCG, and if you can refer me to that podcast. If not, what are your thoughts on this? Thanks very much and keep up the good work. Best from Vienna, Diana. Now, I think... Back at Twim 41, which was at ICAC, and you were there, Michael, right? Yep. We had Bill Bishai on, right? That's correct. And I believe we did talk about BCG, right? We did, indeed. Okay, so, Diana, I refer you to that. And if it doesn't uh, work for you, let us know, and we'll find something else. And the last one is from Ben, who writes, Dear Twimmers, I'm writing from Sydney, Australia, where it is currently sunny and 16 degrees C with wind gusts up to 40 kilometers per hour. After the... Actually, the extreme heat of our summer, I'm grateful for the cooler conditions. I just wanted to thank the Twix folks, but particularly the Twim and Twivo teams for putting out the great podcast material that was particularly useful to me in writing a review of Donna Haraway's recent book for the Sydney Review of Books. And he provides a link to a lengthy review uh, that he wrote where he actually he says, I draw on material from TWIM 34, TWIM 64, particularly Elio's contributions, and TWIVO 11, Nicole King's work with coanoflagellates. And he has actually little audio clips embedded uh, in wow. his article from TWIM and TWIVO and other sources as well. Really nice. Cool. Thank you. As I was writing my essay, it was really pleasing to see that Twix material is licensed under Creative Commons. And that I could go ahead and use some of your great material in my essay without having to worry about copyright issues. It's great to see that your many comments about free and open scientific publishing also extend to the Twix podcast. Um, well, Ben, how could I espouse open access if I didn't practice it myself? Right? I mean, it would be <laughs> crazy not to. But yes, you can always use material on all of our podcasts. We do appreciate a link back. And you did that. So that's great. Uh, finally, also, I apologize in advance if I've got anything wrong in relation to the science in my essay. I am a mere artist writer, but I'm committed to thinking across disciplines because I reckon that understandings from contemporary biological sciences are central to our ability to share the planet with the rest of life and that art can help us to imagine futures that don't take us further down the path of mass extinction. Wow. That's pretty serious stuff. And on that cheery note. <laughs> yes. We'll, we'll, we will end. We will end, not the earth, but we will end Twim. I would just like to say, you say you're a mere artist writer, but I don't think you should say mere. We're all doing things that we like, and that's that's what it's all about. All right. Uh, Twim, you can find at uh, Apple Podcasts. You can find it at microbe.tv slash twim and also asm.org slash twim lots of places where you can find it consider becoming a patron of twim and, and the other podcasts that we do you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute to find out how you can help us out and of course we love getting your questions and comments you can send them to twim at microbe.tv michelle swanson is from university of michigan thanks michelle thank you my pleasure Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thanks, Elio. My pleasure again. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of WIM. 
and Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. 